Uh, so the, the title is not provocative, but at least to uh, try to intrigue you. Um, but it's the core of, of the story. So the normativity is, is the core of the entire story of uh, um, what I'm going to tell you. But the first two words, first thoughts, are also important <laughs> as I'm struggling a lot. But I'll, I'll tell you more about it. Uh, telling you more about it, just I, I want to start with who I am. Um, I studied a long time ago, 20 years ago, nuclear physics in, in Belgium, Leuven and ethics. Uh, I, I did my PhD in the Belgian Nuclear Research Center on the ethics of uh, nuclear waste. And then I was in policy advice for uh, seven, eight years. And nine years ago, I, uh, I started in uh, Eindhoven University in the philosophy of uh, an ethics group. Um, so I'm a philosopher and an ethicist of technology, whatever that might me, uh, mean. Um, but I have always been a system philosopher. I feel deep inside. But my, uh, I am interested in, in many, many things. My, uh, my supervisor pushed me last year to say, okay, but what is your core? And I said, I'm a system philosopher. <laughs> And that was really, it really felt like coming out <laughs> uh -huh. uh, because I've always been a system philosopher. I say, yeah, that's, that's what I really want to develop. Uh, but also, uh, so that's um, what I'm now starting to look into. And, and as you know, maybe studying Luhmann for 20 years or so, it's, it's uh, complex, but I really feel so. Uh, Richard is one of my PhD students, um, but, but I feel even more new in the topic. Uh, so I feel really like a first year PhD student uh, thrown in the complexity of philosophy uh, uh, and, and finding my way out. This presentation will be a little, a little bit of promotion, I would call it also um, yeah, provocative a bit. So just telling what we are doing in, in Eindhoven and then really focus on the, on the content. The promotion, so I said I, I, I decided a year ago to, to focus everything that I'm doing uh, on, on systems. Uh, and, and one of the good things is that in a an, in an technical university where Richard and I are, um, the word systems is everywhere. <laughs> uh, I just put here uh, seven names of groups and there are really more. Uh, so we have technical groups like systems and control systems, engineering, manufacturing systems, engineering, physics of social systems even. Uh, I'll tell you more about that later. Uh, and we have a, one department of social sciences where, where uh, Richard is in uh, more on the, the management uh, and entrepreneurial side. I'm in the philosophy. There is a group working on ecosystems, on technology, technology innovation systems, what, what Richard was uh, talking about. Transition studies, who also focus on uh, systems, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot going on on systems, except, except in the philosophy and ethics group. Their systems, system philosophy is really, it's not, it's not even a taboo, it's a non-issue. Nobody talks about it. Um, so I'm trying to introduce it there. Uh, and we were lucky to, to have some project granted uh, the, in the recent two years. And uh, I, I briefly want to tell you what, what is happening. Just if, if someone is interested in one of these projects, please contact me and then we can have a, a chat or an email conversation on that. Uh, one of the uh, project is on this, uh, this group of physics of social systems. So these are fluid physicists. They, they look at fluids, they have models. Um, but they use these models to monitor crowds in train stations. So they have cameras all over the train station uh, and they, they can really monitor individuals, completely anonymized, but they can follow an individual and they can follow all individuals at the same time. So they really see flows in the, in the train station and you can study uh, when th things become too crowdy, um, yeah, if it's not safe enough, uh, if the attention goes down, like after a football match and there is like uh, thousands of drunk supporters uh, in, in the train station, etc. You can all see this in the, in the modeling. And Andre Damiski uh, is, is uh, started at first in the 1st of September uh, in, uh, in this research where we will apply Luhmann to uh, these crowds. So are crowds systems, yes or no? Can you use Luhmann, yes or no? And, and if you can, how should you do it? Uh, another project also started the 1st of September, so very recent, uh, is uh, on, on looking at ecosystems of universities. So we have uh, 
we are experimenting with education and we call it challenge-based learning where we invite external stakeholders, uh, people from companies, they have, a, they have a problem they are solving and our students solve this on the technical level, but also on the ethical level. There are always ethical aspects to it and um, they, they come up with a solution for these stakeholders. So they don't get um, lectures on Luhmann, but they have to uh, apply Luhmann and to, uh, or, or other philosophers and sociologists to, uh, to solve stakeholders, uh, external stakeholders problems. Uh, and we will study uh, using Lumen how uh, the university will change if we use these uh, ed kinds of education because there is much more interaction with the with, uh, outside world, but also how these companies will change in, in their responsibility and um, in their, their um, ethical uh, aspects. Uh, uh, next project is on uh, uncertainty in decision making in regional sustainable transitions. Uh, that's uh, Atabik Aghwan uh, as a PhD student looking at um, in the Netherlands you have uh, national sustainable targets and they are translated in regional ones and the regions have the responsibility to develop their own decisions to come up with a solution uh, to, to get new um, New measures to get these uh, to get to these numbers of of, uh, yeah, of sustainable transition, uh, and and do their share in the in the transition. And um, Atabek is studying this not from a Lumanian perspective, but really looking at systems and uh, causal loop diagrams. And then you already heard uh, uh, Richard this morning, uh, so I can be short on that. But so looking at critical systems, critical innovation, methodological individualism focusing on empirical approach, etc. Uh, so these are four uh, projects we are doing or starting up. Um, but today I, I want to tell you about something that, that I am struggling with personally and what I tried, will try to uh, work on. Um, and I'll, uh, so I said I'm starting up in, in Lumen um, and I, I will use two sources today, uh, social systems and then the sociology of the moral and ethics. Um, as two, two sources. And as a starting point, um, so Luhmann talks about the sociology of the moral and ethics and in this uh, short article he, and, and this was also discussed this morning, uh, um, he as a sociologist uh, takes a descriptive approach um, and he's very critical about ethics of, um, uh, of ethics and, and, and morality. And the critique he is he gives is from outside the ethics discipline. But of course, I am a, I'm an ethicist, so I feel um, uh, not attacked. <laughs> That's too strong, but I feel um, spoken to. Eh? Um, so I have a slightly different approach here, and I try to clarify what that exactly is and what it exactly means. And as a a working title I would I would talk about the ethics of the moral in society so I would talk about the moral and ethics is a is a an approach to study this this moral which is not sociology of course so I am an ethicist I am interested in further theorizing the the auth the auth in ethics so people uh, use this we ought to do this or, or that and I'm I'm interested in further theorizing it uh, and I think, um, so this, this approach of looking at the ethics of the moral in society could be very useful. Um, and as such, I hope to contribute to the ethics discipline. So, so bringing Luhmann in, in the ethics discipline, which is um, far from simple. It's, it's what uh, Richard was talking about this morning, bringing Luhmann into the TIS community. Uh, I, I will try to bring Luhmann in in the ethics uh, community. And this idea links with many, many questions. Uh, um, I mentioned a few here. How can descriptive theories make recommendations? Uh, so many descriptive theories make recommendations in the end for a philosopher that's, uh, or an ethicist, that's um, a challenging thing. So how, where does the recommendation come from? Where are, if, if there is an, a norm there or a value or a preference, where does this preference come from if you have a, a descriptive theory? Is a non-normative observation theory uh, possible, possible? For me as an ethicist, being uh, very interested in, in 
ethics, I would say no. I think many sociologists would say yes. Uh, but that's also a, a nice question. How do uh, normativity and description relate in systems? So I think normativity, I understand something different about normativity than, than Luhmann would do, and maybe you understand it also differently than, than I do. Or another question, how can ethics support improvement of normative uh, statements in systems? So is there a way of doing ethics linked to system theory that you can contribute to some to the way that people as psychic systems in social systems make normative statements and struggle with that? And can you be of a help of an improvement in some way or another? Because that's the this this dream of the or the, the often the, the assumption of ethicists. Um, questions that are very broad, and, and uh, now I, I don't have an answer at all, but uh, so, unclarity everywhere. I hope to see some light and have some, some uh, comments from your side as well. Um, a thing to start from is this, this distinction between normative and descriptive. Um, and if you have theories like Kant or, or others, it's clearly uh, normative and the descriptive part is very, very, very low. Uh, if you have descriptive theories and, and in philosophy, in, in the field of uh, technology of uh, the philosophy of technology and the ethics of technology, actor network theory, for example, is, is one that is broadly used. It is very descriptive, um, but it is actually not normative in its theory itself, but it does make a lot of um, uh, normative statements in the end. It makes a lot of recommendations. Uh, if I look to the, the theory, then what I call here internal system dynamic description, so how how does the, in the network or in the system, things are negotiated, then uh, actor network this, uh, theory gives some information, but compared to Luhmann, um, it gives rather little. And there I'm, it might be, it might seem bizarre, but I'm, that's one of the reasons why I'm attracted to, by Luhmann um, to, because I think Luhmann gives an, uh, a very extended, uh, explanation of the internal system dynamic uh, description. Although he, as far as I understand him, says also he, I am descriptive and I'm not normative. Now, if I, if I read the sociology of the moral and ethics, uh, this is, he makes these strong claims here. Uh, he makes them elsewhere as well. Eh? So I, I can read them here. Only this sort of arrangement makes it possible to keep function systems separate uh, and to reproduce open options that is contingency within the system. Uh, and this clearly excludes a moral integration of the society because it excludes the identification of the code values of the function system with the positive negative values of the moral code. So clearly um, making a distinction between morality uh, and ethics on the one hand and possible other systems and uh, it goes on here. Um, yeah, okay, highly suggestive to simply upgrade the positive or negative values of the function system with the corresponding moral value. So it's really a, a strong statement and related to ethics. I think this is one of the core uh, opinions of, uh, of Luhmann. But the, for me, the nice thing, if, if you read along in this text, uh, there are sentences like, uh, we certainly would strongly object to all kinds of things. Uh, this simplification he was talking about uh, earlier or ending this paragraph, uh, we see the temptation, but we also see that our society has to avoid such confusion of moral and other codes. And it has to, so that's the old, that's the normative uh, statement. For me as a philosopher, I see there, that's an advice and where does it come from? in a descriptive theory. And then the next sentence of the, the next paragraph, the most remarkable fact is that we would morally object to such a fusion of codes. And this is meant to be an empirical statement. So he stresses his empirical approach because it's, he says, I'm observing this, that others do this. The moral itself accepts and even postulates this dissociation. Now I am an uh, ethicist and using this actor network theory, there the um, the starting point is completely different. Uh, the starting point is that ethics is intermingled. It's it's really 
in everything. It's in the objects, it's in the discussions of people, it's in the actors, it's, it's everywhere. So there is a discussion there, but point here is that these are, um, for me, uh, normative statements that he makes as well. Uh, and he's, I think he's struggling with it because he has to stress that it is an empirical statement, but it's, for me, this is a normative statement from a descriptive theory. Um, so where, where does the uh, moral objection then come from? Uh, my intuition is that um, one of the questions I have is, it is, is this uh, the ethics of the moral in society, is this sufficiently explained by Lumen? Um, so that's something I am now intrigued in and I'm uh, trying to find out uh, more about. So my aim, and here it really becomes uh, fuzzy and, and, and messy in my head, uh, but if I look at ethicists or social scientists, then if someone makes uh, scientific results and recommendations, they are, for me, linked with one's personal uh, values as a psychic system and being part of social systems, also with the social systems. Uh, these recommendations, therefore, for me, are not universal. I have to specify what that is. They are also not rel uh, uh, relative, uh, so it's not uh, relativism. Um, but for me, and that's the direction, it's not an answer yet, but it's a direction, they are relational to the dynamic of the system. So if, if a social scientist does an observation and makes a, a claim, um, it is related, there are values, there is normativity related to where this claim uh, was, was born, was, was uh, produced, and that's in the dynamic of the system that, that was before. Huh? Um, so in trying to theorize this and describe this, um, this relational to the dynamic of the system, this fake uh, thing. Um, I think Luhmann is nevertheless very promising. Um, distinction, observation uh, are core to his theory. Eh? So observation means nothing more than handling distinction. Self-observation is thus the operative factor of autopoiesis. So it's really core in his theory, the, 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 the distinction. And for me, distinction is very close to normativity because you you, dis, you, you make a distinction between what ought to happen and what does not ought to happen. Um, but you have to link it with the system. And also here, Luhmann has a very uh, elaborate uh, theory. So observations are conditioned in a system. Uh, they are uh, system characteristics as norms, con cognitions, schema that, that determine, um, that not determine, but uh, have an influence on 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 what what will be uh, the next um, actions or the next uh, uh, handlings in uh, in the or next observations in the system. And this also includes morality for Lumen, um, being the totality of the conditions for deciding the bestowal of esteem and disdain within a system. Uh, and so he also says every schema taken in itself increases the probability of accumulating so socializing experiences one direction of the other. So you see that um, going from observation that are conditioned, norms, conditions, schema and morality um, have a socializing experience. And this also, um, and understanding this can be done by second uh, order observer, but so all these concepts are for me very promising to understand the link between uh, the descriptive, the description of a system, the theory of a, of a system dynamic on the one hand and how uh, normativity, the ought to, the, the ethics, the, no, no, not the ethics, the, the morality happens in a system. Uh, there are more culture shared symbolics, so there are many more. I have to read much more and, and read it again and again to better understand it. But so for me, it's very promising. And so I, again, uh, my last, last slide, uh, many, many, many questions. Uh, so I have, I think I have to uh, specify for me what is normativity. 
Also, what is a system? The discussion we had this this morning. Uh, so, is social law a system? Um, is is for me an, an important question because uh, the way I treat system is not uh, is is I think also different than Lumen treats it. So I, I have to really figure that out. How separated should morality be as a system? So for me, in in these theories of actor network theory, uh, morality is is everywhere. So and they stress it, and I I really like that. So and that's not far from so. For Lumen, it's it's separated, and then you have all kinds of um, uh, links, relations, uh, interpenetration between systems. But I have to understand this better as well. And then the the remaining questions I already talked about: How can uh, descriptive theories make recommendations? Can you have a non-normative observation uh, over a non-normative uh, theory? How do normativity and description relate to systems and how can ethics support improvement of normative systems uh, statements in systems? So that's the one of the core questions of, of ethics or at least the, the uh, applied ethics of trying to support uh, process. And that's what we in the technical university are pushed to, uh, to, to help the, the scientists who are making innovations. How can we support them on at the ethical level. Uh, yeah.